can say. We talked about what we're calling the fundamental theorem of fractions, which is that if you have a fraction, who resumes doing the input lag thing, if you have a fraction, you can multiply top and bottom by the same number, and it won't change the fraction. And one of the applications of this is what we call producing fractions. So we've already made the observation that a fraction can be written in different ways. For example, the fraction one half is equal to the fraction two of four worths. Um, If this definition makes this sound more complicated than it really is, but if a fraction is not equal to another fraction, with a smaller denominator, we say that fraction is reduced or fully reduced, or there are a handful of other things we could call it, but that will do for us. So going here and taking a look, this fraction is not fully reduced because it's equal to another fraction with a smaller denominator. Two, of course, is smaller than a four. In general, we want our fractions to be reduced. And there are exceptions to this rule. I mean, the main exception is that sometimes you have a lot of fractions and you want them to have the same denominator for ease of comparing them. But let's say you're looking at um, something in parts per million, and you have 51, one million, and 79, one millionth and a hundred one millionth. Well, if I'm right, and it can be quite hard to look at a fraction and determine this, but I believe the first two fractions are in reduced form. I don't think we can reduce them any further. This fast fraction isn't. We could cancel out some zeros, 
but reducing this last fraction is going to make it hard to compare to the first two fractions. Here, it's convenient to not simplify that one one meal even though you could. So this is not a hard and fast rule. I mean, another good example is if you're taking some interval and cutting it into pieces. Like you're taking the interval from zero to one, and you're cutting it into six pieces. Well, that's one sixth, two sixths, three sixths, four sixths, five sixths. And if we wanted to, we could say that one is six sixths. And this makes perfect sense. The third pick mark um, after zero is the third piece. The fifth pick mark is five over six and so on. If you insisted on reducing these, you would get a bunch of numbers with different denominators. And again, going back to kind of this issue, it's no longer convenient to compare them. And, you know, is it obvious that the distance between the th um, fourth and the fifth check mark, the distance between one over two and two over three, is it obvious that that's the same distance as the distance from one over six to one over three? It's probably not obvious. So there are exceptions, but I mean, the counterpoint is that small numbers are usually going to be easier for us to work with. So if we can have a smaller denominator, we'd like a smaller denominator. So how do we get a smaller denominator? If we have a fraction that is not reduced how can we reduce it And the answer is that it's tricky, or potentially tricky, because you have, first of all, you have to recognize that the fraction is not fully reduced. How did I recognize that 100 over a million is not fully reduced? Well, I recognize that it's the same as one over 10,000. Is 79 over a meal then for the reduced? It's not really obvious. I mean, I kind of think it is, but I don't honestly know. So there's no sort of magic answer to this. So that, let me put the question on the board, first of all, kind of under this main question, we'll have a sub-question. How do we know 
a fraction isn't fully reduced. And the answer to that is that we have to recognize that the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator would be the formal ways of writing that. But we have to recognize that the top and the bottom can both be divided by the same number. And when I say it like that, I'm making it sound easy, but it's not. I mean, Are the top and the bottom divisible by the same number? How do you know? And the textbook gives these tricks. Um, if we weren't trying to move a little faster through this earlier material, we could go through them in detail. But like, how do you know if a number is divisible by three. How do you know if it's divisible by seven? How do you know if it's divisible by, and I think it gets up to 12, and after that, the trick stops. So how do we know if top and bottom are divisible by 13? Well, we don't. Short of manually doing the division and seeing if it works. So I normally just check a few numbers that I think of as obvious. Are the top and bottom divisible by two, three, five, ten? And if the top and the bottom are divisible by any of those numbers, I say, okay, this is clearly not in reduced form. Let's see if we can reduce it a little. Um, to decide whether the top and bottom are divisible by two, well, that's probably something we can do without a lot of uh, angst. We check whether they're both even. So the top here isn't even, so it's not divisible by two. A number is divisible by 10 if it ends in a zero. So, scooching back a little, the reason I knew that this was not in its reduced form is that the top and bottom both end in a zero. They're both divisible by 10. Five, it's divisible by five if it ends in a five or a zero. Three, honestly, yes, um, these are the only rules that I've ever internalized. I don't know if everyone's internalized this, so just to make sure, 
to check if a number is divisible by three, you add the digits, then ask if the sum is divisible by the three. So going back to this example, one plus five plus seven is 13. 13 is not divisible by three. You could actually use the exact same trick if you needed to. Three plus one is four and four is not divisible by three. Or you could just see it. Um, And the bottom is also not divisible by three. As I say, I mean, the rest of the, these rules, you might know, is it divisible by four, for example, or whatever? Is it divisible by 11 or eight? You might have to just look those up if you ever are in a position to need to teach them. I mean, I can say, I know the state of Nebraska does not make uh, decisions based on my personal experience. I can say that I've never needed to know whether a number was evenly divisible by 11 or not. It seems like maybe one of those things we shouldn't spend too much time on. But let's say then that we're in a situation where the fraction is not fully reduced and we can recognize that the fraction is not fully reduced without too much 105 is divisible by 5, 150 is also divisible by 5. So this fraction can be reduced. And how do we reduce it? Well, there's an informal way and a formal way of putting this. They both get to the same thing. Essentially, what we do is divide top and bottom by whatever this number they have in common by five. On a more formal level, I mean, why can we do this? You know, we couldn't add five to top and bottom. If we added five to top and bottom, it would change the fraction. So what is it that's allowing us to divide? Well, what's allowing us to divide is that you can think of division as multiplication. Division by five is the same as multiplication by one fifth. And then we're using the fundamental theorem of fractions to know that we're allowed to do this. Um, Sadly, division is a hassle. Um, may, maybe I'm not supposed to say that. I mean, if you're using your calculator, doing the division is just a matter of pressing two buttons. 
Otherwise, well, five into a hundred and five, you might be able to do that without going through the full division, subtraction, bringing down process. Five goes into 10 twice, and then it goes into five once. Five into 250. Again, you might be able to just do that fairly quickly. Otherwise, well, five doesn't go into two, but five goes into 25 five times. Or down a zero. Five goes into zero, zero times, I guess. Anyway, the uh, product is 50. So this is a 21 down here. And that's a 50 down there. And we've at least partially reduced the fraction. Um, it's perfectly possible that this new fraction is still not reduced. I, if I look at it, I'm pretty confident that it is. But we could have, let me see, 2, 4, 8, 16 over 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, for example. And this is not fully reduced. Top and bottom are both divisible by the same number. Um, and you might recognize that top and bottom are both divisible by 8 you're more likely to recognize that top and bottom are divisible by two, though. These are both even. So we can do our reduction and Dividing 16 and 32 by 2 is maybe something we can do in our heads. If not, we can always write down the long division. But it's 8 over 16. Top and bottom are still divisible by 2. Top and bottom are still divisible by two. I mean, this is a kind of weird example. I specifically chose powers of two to make this go for a while, but top and bottom are still divisible by two. 16 over 32 is one half. And again, this is the kind of thing where if you notice that top and bottom were divisible by eight, it would have been fewer steps. And if you notice that top and bottom were both divisible by 16, it would have been a single step. So it all kind of depends. What numbers do you use? Any questions so far? Then I want to transition for, I say transition, it's really the same topic but I, it's still sort of a transition. Simplifying 
or crossing out variables. So two x divided by x to the seventh. is two divided by x to the sixth. And what am I doing here? Well, there are a few ways we could think of this, but fundamentally, I'm doing the exact same thing that I did with 16 over 32. I'm looking at the top and I'm looking at the bottom and I'm asking, do the top and the bottom have any terms in common? And I say, well, X goes in to two X and X goes in x over seven, to x to the seventh, sorry. So I can divide top and bottom by one over x. We have not uh, I guess formally um, done all of this. Maybe it's a little awkward. Multiplication has to come before powers in the textbook, but that means that we're sort of working with powers even though they haven't been formally introduced. What you can hopefully recognize though is that X is x over one, and that entire fraction just cancels away. In the denominator, x to the seventh over x to the first, and here's this sort of awkward situation where the textbook author teaches you how to do this in a later section, but kind of assumes you already know how to do it in this section. If you have a fraction like that, you subtract the powers. So in the top, the x's entirely went away. In the bottom, the x's became x to the sixth. And understanding what you're doing when you make these x's vanish, Understanding that you're actually using the fundamental theorem of fractions is really important because it's going to stop you from making the number one mistake that students make even in college level math. which is seeing something like two plus x divided by x and saying, oh, we have an x in the top and the bottom. I remember this, those x's cancel. And I've called that a mistake. It is a mistake. I mean, why would these x's cancel? What happens if we do try to do that? 
remembering that cancellation is really using the fundamental theorem of fractions. Remembering that when we're canceling x's, what we're really doing is multiplying top and bottom by a fraction. So in the bottom, we have x times 1 over x. That's okay, that's 1. In the top, though, we've got that addition. So how is that x going to cancel? I mean, what's actually going to happen in the top is that that um, multiplication, this multiplication here, is going to distribute across the addition. And we'll get 2 over x. And here, the x's really do cancel. x times 1 over x. That turns to 1. <coughs> But our fraction turns to that, which of course is not what we get if we look at this and say, oh, there are x's in the top and there are x's in the bottom. Let's just cancel them out. Is everyone, I feel like I'm seeing some dubious expressions, but maybe not. Does everybody agree with this? Does anybody have any questions? And let's, let me remind myself what I'm having you do in the homework. So in the homework, it's mostly reducing fractions, but yes, we should do a problem like this, or rather a problem like this, only a little more so. Let's just pick one of these. Let's say we have 5a, minus 7 times a times b divided by a squared. And let's state our goal plus you of simplifying this. And this is why problems like this, exercises like this, are why even though it's a little frustrating, I have trouble blaming my college algebra students who want to cancel like that. Because here we have addition, and there's no way to cancel. Here we have, well, subtraction, but the same kind of thing, and it is possible to cancel. It seems very unfair somehow. But to do cancellation, When you have addition or subtraction, the term you're canceling must show up 
in both. Well, for addition, it would be summons. I'm thinking on what it's called if you're doing subtraction. But you see, we've got a 5a and a minus 7ab. And that 5a and that minus 7ab both have an a in them. And we've got an a, well, an a squared, but n a down in the bottom where there isn't any addition or subtraction. And it is therefore possible to cancel those a's. And again, let's um, think about what we're doing here. We've got the statement that multiplication distributes over addition. And that statement is also true for subtraction. Well, because this is equal to this, usually, we're going from left to right, as it were. We have something that looks like that term on the left, and we want to rewrite it as the term on the right. But there's nothing to stop us from going the other direction. There's nothing to stop us from having a term like the term on the right and pulling out an M as we phrase it, and rewriting it like the expression on the left. And the reason that we can cancel here, but not cancel here, is that if we use that distributive property, in reverse, then that subtraction suddenly turns into multiplication. And you can cancel multiplication. And I mean, the, again, the formal way of thinking of this is that it's the fundamental theorem of fractions, but probably what we start to do pretty quickly is just cancel like that. As long as we have multiplication in the top and the bottom, we can just cross terms out. Okay, so let's get to some stuff. With this, we'll finally, we got behind, but at this, um, when I get to the homework, we'll now be caught up with the homework and the lesson, and we will then seek to stay synchronized. So because we got a little behind, there are actually two assignments. I hope that the first assignment is really easy though, like five minutes of work, just adding and subtracting negative numbers, you know, recognizing that subtraction of a negative is really addition, knowing when a product is positive or negative, stuff like that. I mean, maybe not literally five minutes, but I hope it's uh, it's a relatively painless assignment. And I hope that you have some homework for me. So 
for both of you and then the other assignment. So for both of you, so if you have stuff for me, I'll come around and collect it and we'll get everything graded over the weekend. Yep, let me just, because you can leave after I get uh, your homework. So let me just make sure, or you can work on it here. That's certainly fine. What's the question? I'm just, I'm not confused on this one. Oh, I'm confused. I don't know how to <laughs> scaffold this. Maybe I because isn't that the one where you have to break it, break it all up yeah, in how many groups set it out together? Yeah. So do I need 37 Uh scaffolding is designed to to not have you do difficult division by that by just looking at powers of test. So we ask, can 37 go into this 100 times? Well, no, it can't, because 37 times 100 is too big. It's bigger than this. Can 37 go into this 10 times? Yes, it can, because 37 times 10 is 370, it's less than this. So if we put 37 in 10 times, we'll get 37 groups of 10. Oh, so it's more like just keeping track of it. You don't have to do the block part. No. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. And then I think I'm just overthinking the question, maybe. Yeah, that's... um. When you're asked a question like this, probably the best way to do it is just select some numbers and see what happens. Oh. Let's see if 100 divided by 2 divided by 5. What would that be? 50. This one? Yeah, 100 okay. divided by 2 is 50. And divided by five equals ten. What if we put the parentheses somewhere else? A hundred divided by two divided by five. Well, yeah, or well, at least you can, but it's certainly not. Oh, okay. Important. Okay. So Thank this you. must not be associated. Okay. Thank you. No, because I gave a whole identify my insert. <laughs> okay. okay. I also have a lot of questions. Yes. So, so numbers. Six. Let's start with number six. Um. Okay, I don't understand because on you go to the notes. On the division notes, we don't have. It's happening in your repeated division algorithm. And then that, this one also. Uh, <clears throat> but that's a typo. That's all right. We never did any repeated division. Algorithm. I must mean repeated subtract. Okay, so then I did that correct. Then minus five, minus five. Right. Okay. So you got two in the survey. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so it's like, I don't remember. Um, and then the scaffolding also with this, like when you have to draw all this thing, do you have to look at this number and see how many things you have to combine them into? So like if it's five here, you have to do one, two, three, four, five. Well, again, I mean, I. I drew these blocks just to try to demonstrate what the scaffolding is doing. I wouldn't, so I just asked, have to do that. right, I mean, I just ask, you're right to be using these powers of 10, but like, does five go into this a thousand times? Well, you have 
a thousand here, but five doesn't go into this a thousand times okay. because five times a thousand is bigger than this. Well, and I was trying to subtract the 1,000 from the 1,245 to just get rid of it to bring it down to a smaller number. So then what would I have done in the first? Like, what would I have done? I would. Say, okay, five doesn't go into this a thousand times, but it does go into it. So we go down to the next power of 10. It does go into it a hundred times. So we got mm -hmm. down the hundred, then five times a hundred is 500. We do the subtraction seven four five. Then I ask, does five go into this a hundred times? It still does. I go into this a hundred times? No. Drop down to the next power of 10. Does 5 go into yes. this 10 times? It does. Drop down the 10. 5 times 10 is 50. And you keep and that's kind of tedious once you get down to these small numbers. Sense. But okay. And then, so the first, that was the first thing. Yeah, what's up? So then this one, same with the, oh. Same stuff. Don't have to do that. I'll figure that out. And then, number, okay, so number three, that one confused me because is it asking the, Multiplication. So is it doing three or six times four times three, or would it be like shirts, 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 like six shirts? And then each one of these has like a vest, and then each one of the vests has like a pant. Like, how would that? Um, I mean, those are equivalent, they give you the same number, okay. but in terms of not wanting to obviously write down this whole thing like a bunch of times, I mean, six times four times three is the quick way of- That is it. correct though? Yeah. It's oh, okay, like, thank goodness. In our notes, what was it? Building a sandwich, mm -hmm. we multiply the choices together. Same thing there. Okay, so then eight, nine, and ten. No problem. Slide here. So then number eight. Um, I just don't. I don't know, just know which like method to use the word problem. I guess I'm just really bad. At yeah. No. No problem. Okay. Nobody. So. I mean, let's call this box one, box two, and box three. There are three times as many pennies in the first box as in the third box. So, writing that in terms of multiplication, three times the number of pennies in the third box is the number of pennies in the first box. Good so far? Yeah. And there are twice as many pennies in the second box as in the first box. So two times the first box equals the second box. Okay. And the sort of your goal here 
the first box, the second box, the third box. There were 4,520 pennies in all. So the issue is, you know, if we take B1 plus B2 plus B3, we're going to have, we're not told anything about B3, B3 is B3, whatever, whatever that is. The problem is that if you just add these up, you're going to have multiple constants or variables, I guess, floating around. So kind of the, the brain mass inspiration that we have to have is that because we know that B1 is three times B3, And we know that two times B1 is B2. That tells us that two times three B3 equals B2. So that's six. times B3 equals B2, and three times B3 equals B1. B3, we're not told anything about, it equals itself. But what this allows us to do is add up B1, B2, B3, and get only B3s in the answer. There are six of them, and then there are three of them, so there are nine of them, and there's another one. So the total number of pennies is 10 times the number of pennies in B3. Does that make? Yeah, I think so. So once we find that the total number of pennies is 10 times the number of pennies in B3, mm -hmm. we can solve for this. We can divide both sides by 10 and find that the total number of pennies in box 3 is 452. And then once we know that, 3 times 452 is the number of pennies in B1. Six times 452 is the number of pennies in B2. And we'll then know how many pennies there are in each of the boxes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Last two, last two. Don't worry about it. Okay, so this one, is that like another like array thing that we have to do or like like the series of choices? Like I... Yeah, I mean, we didn't, I guess, really do sort of estimation with multiplication. I need to, in the future, make sure that if I'm changing my lecture, I change the homework. But in nine, we are just looking for an estimation. Okay. There are about 40 rows. Each row has about 20 seats. Okay, so, so that's all. Right. 
Okay, well, that totally makes sense because we did do something pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And then, so the last one, too, is these word problems. <laughs> Is uh, so mentally compute the total number of miles traveled. How do you want us to mentally? Um, Would it just from, be another estimation thing? Well, probably if you're doing this mentally, the way to do it is to think of 62 as 60 plus 2. Okay. Because multiplication distributes over addition. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, we can do 8 times 60. That's 48, um, 480. 8 times 2 is 16. So 480 and another 16 is 496. That makes sense. That makes more sense to mention here. Okay, cool. So are you, what time are you in your office today? Um, I mean, I don't have office hours today. Oh, totally but... fine. But it's like, if I could finish this in like, like when I step out, like 10 minutes or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, if I'm not tired, I'm going kind to of shove it up. Okay, please. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. All right.